Good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship in word. Come all who labor and are weighed down with responsibility, uncertainty, and worry. Come because the load you carry is heavier than you can bear alone. Come all who seek to relate work and worship, leisure and service into a meaningful whole. Come all who are seeking spiritual renewal and practical change for help in making choices and carrying out commitments. Come with your hatreds and loves, your failures and successes, your sorrows and joys. Come, let us worship God, who loves us, who is made present to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come, my friends, let us worship together, and let us greet one another with words of peace, smiling eyes, an enthusiastic waving. May the peace of Christ be with us all.
trusting in the gracious mercy of God, let us confess our sins together before God and one another. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world, to do justice and to love kindness, and to live in hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, hear the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare for the reading and hearing of God's Word, will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. O Lord our God, your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As you know, it's it's been my practice to set up our scripture lessons, to provide context and background, explain key terms, connect the passage to others in the Bible, etc. I do this because such information helps me to hear the lesson better, and I'm hoping it will do the same for you. But our first scripture lesson today needs no setting up. It not only speaks for itself, but it has spoken to people through the centuries. And especially in the final verse, it speaks to us today about how we can live lives pleasing to God. Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Listen now for God's word to us. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself down before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson is also one that has spoken to people through the centuries and continues to speak to us today. It speaks, I think, to the deepest longings of our hearts. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. And thus, gives us reason to hope. It is John's vision from the book of Revelation, near the very end of the book of Revelation, near the very end of the Bible, Chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Listen now for God's word to us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. 
for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. And he said also, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the second in a series of occasional sermons on how we can live happy and faithful lives. A series I'm doing because I think, deep down, we all want to live happy and faithful lives, and because I know that God wants us to live happy and faithful lives. So I want to begin today with a classic problem in theology and the philosophy of religion. So classic, in fact, that you can put it on the blackboard, or whiteboard, or smarts board, or screen share, or whatever. On one side of the board you write God, and under that you write omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, these being attributes traditionally ascribed to God. On the other side of the board, you put evil and suffering. Now square the circle. Reconcile the two sides. Balance the equation. How can God be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, and there still be evil and suffering in our world? Being all-good, God would know about it. God would be able to do something about it being all-powerful. And being omniscient, all-knowing, God would know about it. And yet, there is still suffering and evil in our world. Why? As I said, it's a classic problem, so much so that it's been given a name, the problem of evil. And one reason that it's a classic problem is that it's not just limited to the blackboard or the classroom. We all feel it. We all struggle with it in our lives. Maybe we don't use that exact same terminology, but still we feel it. We still struggle with it. We say things like, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why this? Why now? Why us? Why me? Why? 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 Or in the words of the psalmist, how long, O Lord, how long? Will you forget us forever? So, a classic question, a perennial problem. And so you have to ask, can the question be answered? The problem solved? Well, yes, no. And it really depends on what you mean by answered or solved. There are certainly answers that are less than satisfactory. For example, you can change the terms on one side of the equation or the other. You can say that God isn't really God. Powerful, yes, but not all powerful. So on this view, God did God's very best to reduce all the evil and suffering in the universe, but simply couldn't eliminate it all. Or you can change the terms on the other side. You can say that what we experience as evil and suffering isn't really evil and suffering at all. If we experience it as such, it's only because of our limited perspective. 
if we could see the big picture, the whole of things, what we think to be evil and suffering, well, we would really recognize it as good. Now, that may solve the problem on the blackboard, but not in our lives. It's hard to see how a God who is ultimately stymied by evil is worthy of our worship and adoration. And it's hard to say someone who, to someone who's suffering or when we ourselves are suffering, it's hard to hear. You know, if you just look at the big picture, take a broader view of things, you'd see that this suffering is really a good thing. That's hard to hear. Now, it is true that good can and perhaps will come out of this evil. God can do that. But that doesn't make the evil any less evil as we experience it. There are better answers, of course. For example, you can say that God didn't create evil and suffering. It wasn't God's intention. God made all things good and the whole of things very good. The evil and suffering in our world, although real, is nonetheless a kind of absence, deficiency, or loss, like sickness is the absence or loss of health, that results from our misusing a good gift that God has given us, namely our free will. Correspondingly, on the other side of the equation, you can say that God truly is all-powerful, but God is staying God's hand. God will end suffering and evil once and for all. God will bring good out of evil completely and finally, but not just yet. On this view, God is all-powerful, but temporarily limiting his own power. And evil and suffering are real, but only in the sense that deficiency and loss are real. And most important, deficiency and loss will not last forever. All of which harkens back to John's vision of that future. Look, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. I think these are better answers, but still, they're perhaps not entirely satisfactory. You can still wonder why God is taking so long. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And you can still wonder whether certain evils and the suffering they bring, for example, hurricanes, wars, mosquitoes, viruses, are really necessary for God to bring about the new heaven and the new earth. And you could certainly wonder why God doesn't put some limits or give us more guidance on how we use our free will. Give us governors, if you will. Not to diminish our freedom, but to enhance it so that we can be truly free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And you can certainly wonder all that these days when it comes to hurricanes, wars, and viruses. As I said, it's not just a classroom problem, but one we all feel, one we all struggle with in our lives, and maybe more so these days. I've been thinking about all this recently, because this summer I've been on weekly Zoom calls with my old friends and former colleagues, George and Peter. George is an Old Testament scholar, Peter, a church historian and theologian. George is dying of cancer. About four months ago, the doctors told him that there was nothing more they could do. Peter is coming off major back surgery 
and his recovery has not gone well. Both are pretty much confined to quarters with a good deal of time on their hands. When I asked them whether some days or times were better than others for our Zoom calls, they both just chuckled. A lot of times we reminisce, talk about old times, old friends, former students. Sometimes we talk about baseball, politics, and books. But often we discuss the Bible, theology, and philosophy, like the old days. A few weeks back, George again mentioned an email correspondence he's been having with a young college student, the grandson of a friend of his. The college student found his coursework, especially his courses in Bible, theology, philosophy, and literature, both thrilling and troubling. Thrilling because he loves this stuff. It gets him thinking, gets him going in a way nothing else ever has. Troubling because he doesn't always like the conclusions that his professors, his classmates, or even he himself sometimes arrives at. So his grandfather suggested that he contact George. And so the email correspondence began. And of course, recently, the student asked George about the problem of evil. So the three of us, George, Peter, and I, talked about the various ways of addressing the problem, some of which I've already talked about. But near the end of our conversation, we asked George what he had actually said to the student in his email. Well, he said, I went through many of the arguments like we just did. But in the end, I said to him that when I look back on my own life, when I look back on the years, I see that I've experienced the grace and the goodness of God in so many ways, so many unexpected ways, through so many different people, that I just have to believe that God isn't finished yet, isn't finished with me yet. I told him that now, now more than ever, I have faith that all will be well, that every kind of thing will be well. And when George said that from his little box, I thought to myself, that's it. That's an onion. It's onions. The answer to the problem of evil is onions. I guess I better explain that. It's from the brothers Karamazov, Fyodor Dostoevsky's 19th century novel that is simultaneously murder mystery and courtroom drama, family saga and national epic, theological investigation and existential exploration. It's also a great novel. There's a scene, a central scene, in which a character, she's not a very appealing character. She's both histrionic and self-indulgent. Nonetheless, she has a moment of mutual understanding and appreciation, really of love, with another character based on a small, simple act of human kindness that she did. And in describing her act of kindness, she simply says, I gave an onion. Now, she didn't literally give an onion. So when someone asks her to explain, she says this. It's just a fable, but a good fable. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a woman and she was wicked as wicked could be. And she died. And not one good deed was left behind her. The devils took her and threw her into the lake of fire. But her guardian angel stood thinking, what good deed of hers can I remember to tell God? Then he remembered and said to God, once she pulled up an onion and gave it to a beggar woman. 
And God answered, Now take that same onion, hold it out to her in the lake, let her take hold of it and pull. And if you pull her out of the lake, she can go to paradise. But if the onion breaks, she stays where she is. The angel ran to the woman and held out the onion to her. Here, woman, he said, take hold of it and I'll pull. And he began pulling carefully and had almost pulled her all the way out when the other sinners in the lake saw her being pulled out and all began holding on to her so as to be pulled out with her. But the woman was wicked as wicked could be. And she began to kick her feet. It's me who's getting pulled out, not you. It's my onion, not yours. No sooner did she say that than the onion broke. And the woman fell back into the lake and is burning there to this day. And the angel wept and went away. As the character in the novel says, it's just a fable, but it's a good fable. The good we do and the good we receive, the acts of kindness, are onions. What the fable tells us is that no act of kindness, no matter how small it may seem to us, goes unnoticed and unrewarded in heaven. And it tells us that when we receive such kindnesses, we must pass them along. We must pay them forward to others. In sum, the fable tells us that there is a divine onion economy. And that participating in it brings us joy, life, and hope. To my mind, George was telling the young student about the onions, all the onions, the abundance of onions he had received during the course of his life. But I couldn't help think about all the onions, the abundance of onions George had given in his life, including to me and including to that young college student. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? You see, some questions you answer on the board. Other questions, the more important ones, I think, we answer with our lives. That doesn't mean that what happens in the classroom doesn't matter. It does. What we learn there, the experiences we have there, the conclusions we reach there have an effect, sometimes a profound effect, on how we live our lives. But ultimately, our answer to the problem of evil and other big questions like it is not something we put on the blackboard and leave there. It's something that we live out throughout the course of our lives. Our lives become our answer to those questions. Our lives become a witness to what we truly believe about them. What George was doing for that young student, both in their email com correspondence and really with his whole life, was witnessing. Witnessing. I know, I know. For many of us Presbyterians, including myself, say that word and we are looking for the exits. Witnessing too often means histrionic and self-indulgent stories in which a person tells how he was saved and in so telling the story puts himself and not God at the center. But that's an abuse of witnessing, not the real thing. Witnessing in its true form tells of God and the grace we have received from God and how that grace has changed our lives. 
it puts God at the center of the story. And when you witness about God's grace in your life, it helps me to see and appreciate God's grace in my life. Our stories may not be the same. They probably aren't. But they are both congruent and convergent. When you put them on top of one another, they look alike. And even when apart, they point in the same direction. That is, in the direction of hope. And so witnessing itself becomes part of the divine onion economy. Through it, we pass along the onions we have received. And the heart of that divine onion economy, the source of all its joy, life, and hope is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Jesus Christ is the onion of all onions. And so, even in the face of all the evil in our world, we have hope. A hope that is not wishful thinking, but is based on our shared experience of the grace and goodness of God. We have hope that one day God will dry every tear, that one day evil and suffering will be no more, and that one day all will be well. Every kind of thing will be well. That hope is our answer to the problem of evil. And it's the best kind of answer. An answer that enables us to go on. And the voice from the throne said, I am making all things new. These words are trustworthy and true. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The answer to the problem of evil is onions, a happy and faithful life, a life of onions and hope. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together what it is that we believe. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Friends, God is ever faithful in blessing and in love. With thankful hearts, let us offer up to God a portion of what God has given to us. Following worship, your gifts may be placed in the offering boxes in the narthex and across from the elevator, given electronically or sent by mail. Let us pray. Generous God, we thank you for these gifts. Multiply them and use them to do your work in this community and throughout your world. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we'd like to welcome you to Westminster Presbyterian Church. Your presence adds to our community, and we are glad that you are here. Please take a moment to fill out the fellowship pad, which is located on the outside end of your pew. As the pad is passed back, please notice who you are worshiping with so that you may greet one another by name at the end of the service. Let us pray.
Creator God, we thank you for the changing seasons, for cool breezes after hot and humid days. We thank you for the gift of a holiday weekend and the opportunity to rest from our labors. We thank you for the laughter of children and young people and marvel at their resiliency and flexibility. We thank you for the beauty of creation that surrounds us, for majestic trees that provide shade and shelter, the hues of wildflowers along the side of the road, and the songs of the birds about their daily tasks. We thank you for this community and the opportunity to gather together, to hear your word, to sing your praise, to worship you, the Lord of all. Merciful God, our world is hurting. Every time we open a newspaper or look at a screen, we are overwhelmed by images of those who suffer and grieve. This morning, we think especially of those whose lives have been forever changed by natural disasters, like Hurricane Ida, wildfires, historic flooding, extreme heat and earthquakes. We pray for those who are sick and for communities that are struggling to take care of all those in need. We pray for those who are hungry and hurting, for those who are angry and afraid, for communities in conflict and countries at war and for all those whose lives are at the mercy of the decisions of others. Be with our leaders and all those in authority. Give them wisdom and hearts of compassion. Help the helpers. Give them strength, endurance, and support to care for themselves as they care for others. In your mercy, Lord. Oh God, lastly, we pray for ourselves. Thank you for loving us when we struggle. Help us to care for your world and our neighbors. Help us to be people who love deeply and are quick to respond to the needs of others. Give us strength when we are overwhelmed and rekindle hope when we struggle to find the way through. Help us to be people who work for peace with justice and who shine your light and love into the darkest places. We pray all this in the name of the teacher who heals and transforms lives, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, let us live our lives in hope, remembering all the blessings, the onions, that God has given us and continues to give us, and ready to share them with others. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be ours now and forevermore. Amen.